Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the latest monthly virtual iteration of the EFF Austin Meetup. Uh, my name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. And uh, for those of you who don't know or are first time uh, attendees, EFF Austin is an Austin based digital civil liberties advocacy group. We um, are closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco, which is the nation's oldest digital civil liberties advocacy group. You can think of them as the ACLU for the internet. But they uh, basically fight for a whole bunch of good things like encrypting the internet, fighting for net neutrality, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, pushing back on warrantless surveillance from a whole host of public and private actors, and just generally being cool people. Uh, you should give them money so they can keep up their fight. And, you know, we appreciate money too, though if your funds are limited, uh, you should give it to them first. But you can go to EFFAustin.org both to learn more about us and get involved and donate. Um, yeah, so um, uh, this is generally when I do a few little quick announcements before I introduce our speaker. But um, first, just to preview some of what we have coming up over the next couple months. Um, so our February speaker is going to be a uh, former EFF Austin board member and local Austin activist extraordinaire Kathy Mitchell, who was actually recently named by the Austin Chronicle as uh, one of 20 Austinites of last year that they were very impressed by. But uh, Kathy has been central in the fight for uh, criminal justice reform here in Austin, Texas. And um, we frequently collaborate with her in activities in that space when it comes to digital civil liberties and police justice reform. Specifically, we collaborate with her on trying to give feedback to Austin City Council on a grant for the Austin Police Department related to uh, copyright enforcement. And we gave council some feedback on the ways such a grant might be abused to go after the little guy. So Kathy is a very amazing activist. She does a lot of awesome work and she's gonna be coming and speaking to us about, to that end, she's very familiar with the uh, Texas legislature and, and the lobbying process that goes on there. She's going to be coming and talking to us about some bills that are going to be before the legislature that are relevant to digital civil liberties. So if you want to hear a real expert wonk talk about that sort of stuff and get this stuff on your radar so you know which bills to tell your rep, hey, I don't like that bill, then you should come. Also in March, we're going to, um, oh yes, I almost forgot the name, but in March, we're going to have a cybersecurity expert named Casey O'Brien come and talk. I don't want to overpromise exactly what his talk is going to be about, but based on the initial overtures, I think we may be having some discussion about the Solar Winds hack and specifically what's been learned and some of the fallout from that. So, you know, uh, that's a big important issue that has basically been forgotten because there's a bunch of really crazy stuff going on right now. But if you want to keep yourself informed on that, the March meetup would be a good one to attend for that. And I will say those are the only two that we've got booked so far for the coming year. I forgot to say at the top, these always happen currently on the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Uh, continuing to be virtual for the time going ahead. I imagine at some point we will eventually look into resuming physical meetups at Capital Factory, but that's probably not going to be for, you know, frankly, probably a half year would be the earliest I would see us considering that pivot. So second Tuesdays of the month, 7 p.m., um, there will be announcements on our various social media channels that give you the link to attend. But, um, but to that end, yes, April on is currently not booked. If you know of an interesting speaker or you're an interesting speaker yourself and would like to talk to us about something, we're always looking for speakers, especially um, uh, diverse speakers. So especially if you know any women or people of color who might like to give a talk, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, yeah, and also I guess I'll just say that some of you may be aware that we had started uh, running also a kind of EFF Austin virtual book club. We just wrapped up the first book of that. We're going to be taking a bit of a hiatus on that before we pick a second book um, because our board member, David, who runs it, is going to be pivoting to some other work, which I will tell you about in one second here. So the book club will be on temporary hiatus, but we will be back hopefully to discuss uh, topics in more depth than we can sometimes get into in these meetups. 
Um, and yeah, just to that end, our board member David is going to be working on doing some write-ups about the bills that are currently before the Texas House and Senate related to digital civil liberties. Those are going to be available on the EFF Austin website when we get those up. Check our social media portals or mailing lists or whatnot for more details. And you can read up on those and become more informed on what is currently proposed for this session. Um, finally, I guess the last sort of ongoing work we're currently working on that I'm going to announce is we are continuing to try to uh, gather signatures to eventually present a petition to Austin uh, City Council about introducing um, a facial recognition ban for law enforcement use here in Austin, Texas. So if that's uh, been an issue that has mattered to you and you are based in the Austin area, go here and sign EFF's petition so that we can eventually get enough signatures to present to council. It's a little harder than normal to get signatures during a pandemic. So it's hard to just stand outside in front of HEB like we might do under more normal circumstances. But yes, tell your friends if you care about that and get them to sign it. Um, I think that's the end of my boring announcements. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to ask, does anybody from the community have an announcement they'd like to make? Shameless self-promotion's totally okay. You can literally tell everybody, hey, check out my cool podcast or something. I don't care. As long as you think it would be of interest and relevant to the Digital Civil Liberties community. Uh, does anybody have any announcements they'd like to share? No? Okay. Then without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this month and uh, get to sit back and listen for a little bit. <laughs> our speaker this month uh, is Joey Lopez. Joey Lopez um, is the Media Lab Director in the Department of Communication at Texas A&M University. Um, he received his PhD in New Media uh, from UT Austin, the Radio, Television, and Films ACT Lab program. Um, for those of you who don't know, ACT Lab is a pretty legendary UT Austin program that basically, you can't really describe it, but I guess I just sort of say it's like, making and building stuff with kind of a hackery ethos in a very cross-disciplinary way. It was run by the legendary academic Sandy Stone, um, whose thinking was seminal to a lot of the academic literature around the cyberpunk uh, frontier and cyber studies. Um, and, and, so, and so just to give a little more about Joey, um, using project-based learning and the act lab concept of make stuff, take risks, and be awesome, Joey Lopez's courses engage students in their passions and encourage them to take them outside the classroom and, and into the real world. His students have gone on to an array of careers in business ownership from stunt persons to shark take winners to teachers, lawyers, and newspaper publishers. His research revolves around anthropology, action-based research, and community advocacy. His theoretical explorations include, but are not limited to, race, gender, entrepreneurship, advocacy, alternative pedagogy, and civic engagement. His professional practice includes photography, video, audio, new media, technology consulting, and STEAM-based community programming. He's worked with the Institute of Texan Cultures, Bayard County, Launch SA, CBS Sports, GA Media, 24-Hour Entertainment, The Smithsonian, GMS Racing, Boost Logic, Spare Parts, and many others. And in his spare time, he's an avid road cycler and weight lifter. Um, so yes, we're very honored to have Professor uh, Joey Lopez with us today. And um, Joey is going to be giving us what I think is going to be a very interesting discussion. He's basically going to be exploring, um, in his own words, the joys and risks of being a civically engaged citizen while maintaining disruptive resistance to what has become social media norms. So uh, without further ado, take it away, Joey. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, thank you for the introduction and hello, everyone. Um, as Kevin said, my name is uh, Joey and, you know, everybody just calls me Joey. So um, EFF covers all areas. Oh, yeah. There's the captain down there, I see. If it's the captain, I think it's the captain that's here. And uh, always good to see Muffin here. So um, I uh, am one, I'm really honored to be here uh, to give a talk. Um, you know, the EFF and EFF Austin uh, are held uh, tight to my heart over here somewhere. And um, I, uh, I've been fortunate to get to kind of follow along with EFF Austin um, since the early 2000s. 
Uh, I'm 40 years old, and when I was like 20, I started learning about the EFF and and uh, and EFF Austin, and I got to hear Corey Doctorow give a, a speech uh, way back in those days, and, and I've gotten to hear him speak over and over again, and I've gotten to <clears throat> meet Lawrence Lessig and some other seminal people, and of course, I've gotten to meet people in this in the Austin. Um, Hub, uh, you know, John Lipkowski and and uh, Rich McKinnon and, of course, Kevin and uh, Brandon Wiley and a slew of other um, people that support not only the EFF, but uh, some ancillary in my uh, uh, aura of space uh, um, groups like Nerd Night and uh, Dorkbot. Those uh, Dorkbot Austin and Nerd Night Austin are two uh, meetups that I have always um kind of really held in high regard for uh, collective uh, meetups that are not um, financially driven. They're meetups uh, for the love uh, in terms of like an amateur way rather than a profit driven way. And so it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's always been great to kind of get to be a part of that and experience that. So um with that said, I'm going to give you all a little bit of background about myself so that you kind of understand where I'm coming from, and then um, I'll talk about the topic today. So I'm going to go ahead and get ready to do a little screen share here and um, kind of just give you all some, some background about me. So let me, uh, let me open up a couple things here. All right, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna do a screen share. Here we go. All right, so um, I am uh, fortunate to have gotten to go to UT Austin during a time, as Kevin mentioned, where uh, this professor named Sandy Stone established the ACK Lab in the early 90s, and I arrived in 1999. I um, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and um, I was not considered smart, and I was not smart. Uh, I tested horribly. Um, if you, we were doing standardized tests, uh, I mainly scored between zero and 40, uh, and it didn't even look like it was out of 100. And so I was never considered smart uh, until uh, roughly about my sophomore year in college. So. Uh, I had friends that were like in honors classes. I had friends that were uh, um, really smart, but like I just, I was in all regular classes and I went to an inner city high school um, where I, uh, you know, just was average. And um, my older brother who was uh, one or one of my older brothers who was uh, two years older than me um, had gotten into MIT and then got recruited by UT and um when i was kind of uh in my uh i think junior year um i was able to kind of get a uh, uh an experience um because my brother the people that recruited him you know they were like oh you have a, a a younger brother we can we have some programs that he can go to and so uh one of the programs i went to was mites minorities introduction to engineering and that like changed my life it was one week in um at UT Austin and um, I saw people that look like me and I saw people that were in positions of power and I saw uh, people look like me that were going to college and uh, and then we also went to like the 3M uh, uh, facility research facility we went to National Instruments um, Pickle Research Center and I got to kind of just see all the facets that Austin had to offer um, or a lot of a lot of things that they had to offer. And then uh, I also got to participate in another engineering camp. And this is how I got into UT was that I participated in this camp. I got letters of recommendation from professors and that's how I got in. I wasn't in the top 10%. I wasn't considered smart. I got in and I almost failed out my first semester. And luckily I met uh, um, Sandy Stone and the ACK Lab and that's where things kind of just really changed. And um, in parallel to that, one of the other things, uh, and Kevin didn't mention this, not because he didn't mean to, but just slipped his mind, is that I own a hi-fi store <laughs> that I run called Dreamanoids Hi-Fi. Which San is Antonio, really Texas, cool. Running it. It's like a space out of Mr. Robot. You should visit it if you're ever in San Antonio. 
Yeah, it definitely has a hacker space feel uh, intentionally. And, um, and so in parallel to um, going to university, I also helped run a hi-fi store in San Antonio, Texas. And um, my mentor, uh, Creston Funk, actually, um, and that's Creston right there listening to some single driver paper cone uh, speakers that were handmade in Germany. And literally the, the pulp was made by hand and everything for those prototypes that we were listening to at the time. And, um, and he taught me like about sales. He taught me about aesthetic. Um, you know, our, our shop was so in tune with, with, uh, fringeness that, uh, this is a woman, her name was Kuma. I don't remember her actual name. I just knew her handle from a forum and she lived in Chicago and I would talk to her all the time. And one time she was like, I want to fly down and hear the hi-fi that you sell. And I was like, okay. And so she just flew down and spent a week with us hanging out, listening to hi-fi. Um, and so I had this kind of really visceral experience. And then at the same time, when I went to go get my master's, I worked with my colleague here, this guy, Brandon Wiley. And, um, this was kind of where I went from not just learning that I could do things. I learned that I could teach others and, um, Brandon and I were like very happy go lucky people that ended up uh, in the act lab together at the same time. And we had kind of experienced this kind of fine art approach to learning where I called them bossel wood kickers would come in and critique all your work and kick over all your bossel wood projects, you know, for, for if you're an architect or something like that, you know, this kind of like tear you down and build you back up mentality. And Brandon and I um, just didn't like it at all. Uh, but we're very happy, positive people. So we had to figure out like how to overcome that. And that is where Sandy, Brandon, and I, who Brandon Wiley now runs Operator. If you've ever heard of um, Operator, it's a it's an organization. Uh, whoops, I spelled his name wrong. This Operator Foundation is based out of Austin. They do uh, anonymity obfuscation work. It says Operator makes usable tools to help people around the world with censorship, security, and privacy. And, um, and so Brandon and I created these office hours where we taught people how to do anything. And um, people would be like, well, my girlfriend needs, wants to learn how to sew. And uh, we told her, uh, well, bring your girlfriend and Brandon will teach her how to sew. And this is the photo of Brandon, Brandon teaching uh, one of our students' girlfriends how to sew which he actually ended up knowing from like seventh grade. Um, and, and is, and she is a reason he became vegan evidently, which I always thought was a really funny story. Um, and, uh, and that's what we would do is we would have these crazy office hours where we had communication students, English students, uh, people from interdisciplinary backgrounds that would come and we would just literally do anything. So this guy, um, here Saturday, that was like his handle in the, in the group. Uh, came and would just start taking about taking apart kids electronics and students would start doing circuit bending and this is like circa 03 to 07 kind of time this is uh if some of y'all are like old school austin uh, hacktivism kind of people this is uh jerry chamkis uh, at his house which was if you ever got to ever go see his place he like had ripped out uh his whole house and had built like this uh, mad scientist lab in it and um, I'll never forget him giving a, a presentation at, at Gallery Lombardi showing his um, Cosmophone that took cosmic rays uh, using a, a, a spectrum, um, a spectrometer and converting it to MIDI to make like random noise. And, um, and that was kind of, you know, what I'm basically what I'm trying to establish is that uh, I went from being kind of this inner city high school kid to all of a sudden being surrounded by people that were thinking way, way further than, than I had even thought I would ever start thinking. And, um, and what it, what it ended up doing to me was that like, I would hit all of these roads, uh, crossroads at different points. And every time I picked the harder non high paying road, but the road that I wanted to do. So for example, Brandon and I, um, you know, we would get offers to be like research assistants for like the top researchers in, in our department. 
and we would always turn them down because we wanted to go do like Google Summer of Code or start our own open source project or things like that, uh, do Creative Commons licensing. And, you know, we, um, we would do projects all the time um, to kind of call into question uh, <clears throat> uh, social norms and, and expectations. And, um, you know, one project we did. Hi, I'm Joey, and this is... Sorry, I'm going to go to my studio here is um we launched this thing and and i think it was uh, i want to say it was 2005 it's called act lab um, tv and uh i'm going to show you this short little like kxan clip about us just because it's it's nice and cheesy it's a minute long or minute 33. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Sean. Well, of course, technology changes faster than most of us can keep up with. In fact, we here's a question for you. Have you heard of Internet television? Well, some students at the University of Texas are trying to bring it to the forefront. Kate Wyda is live at UT with the story. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, Tanya. Well, you know, chances are most people at home right now are watching us on cable TV, but can you imagine someday tuning us in on an Internet television station? Well, some students right here at the University of Texas are bringing Internet television to the forefront for the independent media. Can't find anything to watch on TV? Try logging onto your computer. But what we're doing is we're making television for the internet. It's called Act Lab TV. Joseph Lopez and Brandon Wiley, both students at the University of Texas, are creating it as an alternative to cable. There's all of this great filmmaking that's, that's being done, but there's no way for them to distribute their films. So we're going to have documentaries, we're going to have narrative genres like thrillers and uh, sci-fi movies. The goal is to stream independent movies and television shows from around the world 24-7. But we're also getting submissions from all over the internet and uh, you know, independent filmmakers in Austin and all over the world. And they're documenting how it's done, so you can create your own internet television station. They can create their own station and all of our software is free. All of the documentation that we're, we're making is free. Yes, we would like everyone on the internet to run their own television station. All right, sounds good. So there's uh, some good irony that we were watching that on YouTube. But, um, <laughs> but you know, this was kind of the thing was that, um, you know, Brandon, uh, for those that don't know him, is, is a genius and um, he's a polymath and, and he's someone that um, I really respect. And, uh, and so what, you know, what kind of happened after ACLAB TV was Brandon ended up, uh, developing a bunch of peer to peer, um, uh, protocols and worked with a, a bunch of different companies like BitTorrent and, uh, I think it was Onion Networks. And, um, we kind of went on to, I, you know, I went on and, and, and was working on my PhD um, and, uh, and the project itself kind of birthed uh, this assertion along with a lot of other things that were going on at the time. When we were working on this project, this is a project I talked about kind of as a, what I saw as like a pivotal point, not like our project being a pivotal point, but the time being a pivotal point where there were a ton of uh, hackers and geeks that were working on open source initiatives. So there was like Video LAN, uh, the VLC player that a lot of people may or may not be familiar with. Um, you know, that was like a really big, uh, big initiative. You've probably seen this player before. It plays like any kind of format you ever want and it's on every single kind of platform. And um, there was uh, uh, the FFmpeg, uh, library that was uh, uh, like kind of came to fruition during that time and that people kind of really latched on to. You know, of course, there was LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP uh, applications that were being developed uh, at a rapid rate. Ruby on Rails had just come out and people were starting to kind of uh, pick up how to do drag and drop and, and HTML 5.0 was about to come out and people were able to then take that technology and kind of just keep on creating works that um, were more cl uh, are less closed source and more open source and free as in speech rather than beer, which is like the antithesis of what we have in terms of social media at this point. And, um, and so that was kind of like my, my, uh, my background in terms of my experience with, uh, 
in the like in the uh, in the hacker scene. You know, we were giving presentations at Dorkbot, giving presentations at at um, uh, uh, Nerd Night, and um, and in general, I was working with like co-working spaces, and some of my friends had started some of the first co-working spaces. Uh, and San, I mean San Antonio and Austin. Well, and San Antonio too, but uh, in Austin, uh, like um, uh, 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 Conjunctured, which was uh, uh, a really cool first co-work maybe all that were maybe around at the time. But uh, I digress. So let me uh, kind of move on to some other things here. So I just wanted to kind of set that. Uh, this is my actually my dissertation. I, I published my whole dissertation online. Um, Back in 2010, I defended it. I had like uh, 750 views before I went to my defense and I had like 60 people show up to my defense. And uh, it was really cool to defend like a live document and have um, uh, uh, colleagues and fellow students uh, come up and click on the website while I was giving my, my defense and show like the professors where they said I was lacking, they would show like where I actually talked about it. And I was like, wow, this is really awkward, but interesting and kind of a really cool uh, uh, turn of the tables. Uh, it's dissertation.jtlopez.com. I, when I, uh, I think I can open up a chat, the chat here, I'll just post it in there. Um, and, uh, and so it was really cool. Like it was, it was, it was a really stellar time. Um, but yeah, so I had like video introductions and uh, that was like a really big thing at the time was to like have, uh, well, it still is like nobody publishes their dissertation to this day online. There's just a handful of people that can raise their hand and say they've done that even 10 years after. And so uh, my, my whole assertion here was that I was gonna develop uh, works that you could read, watch, or just look at. And so my first article I did that way uh, was this one, I ended up studying uh, online and offline car culture in Central Texas. I studied street racing, road racing, drag racing, and high-end automotive shops because I thought it would be a lot cooler in 50 years to be able to talk about that than to talk about like the finite details of um, kind of the startup scene that was taking place at the time in, in Austin, which was like another big area I was working in. So as you can see, I can literally scroll through this and you can see the photos and uh, flash just turned off and I had flash embedded videos, which I'm slowly replacing with, uh, with YouTube videos. Um, but this article, I have not done that to yet. Um, but if we go to my introduction, I'm going to play just a little excerpt from it. So you can kind of, again, get an idea of this kind of make stuff pedagogy that was being developed, uh, by, well, by a team of us really. Um, actually I want to, uh, uh, yeah, I'll show you all this part and then I'll show you a little bit of the teaching one just so you can get an idea. Let me uh, actually make this small because it'll play better. All right, so. So here I am about to introduce my dissertation with Kuro to Will and uh, he's going to be filming. Now I'm going to be talking about the wild and crazy experience I've been having doing this project slash life experience researching cars in Central Texas and uh, doing a little bit of pedagogical work as well. So I hope you enjoy this. And so this is like my hype introduction where I kind of show like some tidbits of what I'm doing. So here we are with Russell. Here I am doing my dissertation on online and offline car culture in Central Texas. We're over here at Hot Import Nights, shooting some drifting. We're about to go out and do a little hot lap, see how it goes. As I studied Central Texas car culture. So uh, like this was before GoPros and all of those other things. So I was like literally mounting cameras on cars and pure craziness. By the way, if anybody wants to ask questions, you're always welcome to ask a question. Um, and what was also crazy about this was that Brandon um, and I and, and Brandon would go to, we would go to all kinds of meetups. Like if someone told us about something that was happening, we would show up. Um, it didn't matter what it was. And so uh, what ended up happening was we kind of made like this really cool uh, network of, um, of peers and, and hackers and developers and, and uh, civic engagers 
And uh, I'll never forget Brandon inviting um, this guy. Uh, I think his name was Andy Shelton over and was like, hey, this guy works for WordPress. He's like one of the five developers for WordPress. And I was like, that's what I'm using to do my dissertation on. And I started talking to him and showing him how I was adding all these photo uh, 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 galleries. And he was like, wow, I've never seen people just like build out with just the pages and not like have it all be post based. And I was like, yeah, well, this is, you know, my vision and kind of what I'm doing with it. And, um, and to kind of like have that access, like these things were still not closed yet. And to be able to talk to him about how this was being developed and how I was doing it was really interesting. And, and what's nice is that to this day, I mean, this is my dissertation on my server that was on, was and is on WordPress. And I got to like literally interact with the developers at the time. Uh, and so, uh, so everything here, in case you're wondering, gets really meta at some point. And so uh, I said I wanted to show you all just uh, one, whoops, one other uh, video section. So let me go back. And that was about teaching because um, one of the other things I'm going to talk about here is kind of like how do we go from saying things can't be done to things can be done. And, and uh, what we did in the Act Lab was we did project-based learning. So there were no tests. There were no quizzes. It was literally make stuff and take risks. And um, we were really lucky to have this awesome undergraduate student uh, named Amy Stedman who added Be Awesome to it. And uh, I think that really resonated with Brandon and I and, and Sandy because, you know, make stuff and take risks is kind of almost like an order, but be awesome is like a, uh, a MO, you know, it's like a, I don't know, it's something that you like you go and do. And uh, so, yeah, so um, this is just a little excerpt. I'm not going to play all of it. Uh, I'm just going to kind of, let's see here. I kind of introduce a little bit about what I do and then have some people kind of talk about how I do what I do. One thing about Joey's teaching is that he really does make himself available to all the students. He'll say, hey, here's my email, here's my cell phone, this is my contact information. If you need a place to study, you can come to my apartment. If you need a place to work, you can use my garage. If that doesn't work for you, we have a lot of office hours available. You can come to the Act Lab office. I mean, they really do make themselves available. And I think a lot of students are intimidated by that because who makes themselves available that much? I mean, I certainly didn't encounter that before the ACK Lab. Sure, some professors do have office hours, a couple of hours a week, things like that. But to make yourself available to that extent, it's something that I hadn't seen before. I would say that Joe's main role in the ACK Lab is to act as a kind of a lightning rod for energy. Um, he's a you know, a lot of the things that he does are kind of behind the scenes, kind of below the radar, um, but he's really responsible for a lot of the things that actually happen around here. Um, people come to him with their problems at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, they come to him with their, their ideas and questions at 2 in the afternoon, and uh, he's always there to, to help them out and facilitate their learning and creating. I met Joey back in August of 2009. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just leave it. There's kind of short excerpts. Um, it sounds like a bragging video. I don't know what it is, but it's – I get self-conscious about hearing myself. Um, but anyway, you can check it out on, on the URL I sent you. But I, what I wanted to get across is just that um, I was just, I was different. I was different than most professors. Um, and I am different than most professors. I still am this way. You know, you can still come to my apartment. My colleagues can come to my apartment, graduate students, people that I just meet. Like I, um, I'm all about collaboration. So so what happened once I left Austin, right? So Austin, uh, I knew Austin was La La Land. And in case y'all are wondering, Austin is La La Land. Uh, I call it La La Land. I also call it San Francisco La La Land. And the reason I call it La La Land is because as soon as I moved to uh, San Antonio, um, La La Land was over. You know, uh, Austin's like 15, 20 years ahead of San Antonio in pretty much every regard, except for disparity between the rich and the poor. Y'all are even with us. So I guess you can take that award with us, which is that uh, I believe San Antonio and Austin have the highest discrepancy between the rich and the poor um, in the U.S. So uh, it's, it's definitely not a bragging right, but um, that is definitely one of the things that was uh, resonating. And, uh, and when I got to San Antonio, um, everything changed. 
So there was no startup scene. Uh, it was very, very minuscule, and it is to this day. Um, I had to go kind of on this anthropologic uh, uh, tour of San Antonio to figure out why, what was going on. Uh, there was a TEDx following, but there was no, like, bar camp following. There were bar camps that had happened early on in San Antonio, like in the 2005 to, to 2007 era. And, and um, uh, uh, some act labbers like myself and Dustin and Brandon and other people, were, we were fortunate to get to go and interact with that. But by 2010, it had really kind of fizzled out. Like all of what I was talking about were people doing open source software development and kind of driven by, by uh, morals and ethics had gone out the window because of social media and people's drive to kind of do this web 2.0, you know, make lots of money. So that was when South by Southwest interactive, like exponentially blew up and became more significant than film and music. Uh, I mean, I remember we would go in the early days to South by interactive and it was like 20 bucks you know, for like a pass. And now it's like, I, I blame it all on, uh, blame it all on Twitter's, uh, premiere there yeah that was, yeah yeah and so uh and so like i said brand and i were like going to everything it was it was amazing and um and so when i got to san antonio the tone was just really different and so basically what i determined was this uh so the three biggest dod spaces um in the u.s are basically uh bc san diego and san antonio Okay. And, uh, it turns out that like all of the geniuses that are in San Antonio working for the DOD and are some contractor that works for the DOD. So they all have top level high security clearance for which they do not want to meet up and associate with each other and talk about their work and our projects that they're trying to complete our, uh, tasks. And so basically what that did was it, it whittled down the talent base to, uh, a fringe base. And what ended up happening is, is that um, there was like a, a small fringe group and um, they had a hackerspace. It was called Timbit Works. It was started by one of the Rackers um, and some other people. R Rackspace, if you don't know what Rackspace is, it's a hosting company based out of San Antonio and heavily in Austin now. Imagine that. And <laughs> which is like what happens to all of our uh, creative talent. Nobody wants to live in San Antonio. So they all uh, it set up bases in, in Austin, which is also what HEB did. Uh, though they're claiming they're going to have like this new space built downtown in San Antonio. But um, not that I have a chip on our shoulder here in San Antonio, and I'm actually in College Station, by the way, but I'm a San Antonian at heart uh, about Austin. But it, it, it kind of really made things real. And so um, when I started working with students, it was just a whole kind of different space, different kind of student. And... Um, and so I had to like readjust everything. First, I, I had to go to San Antonio and I, I met uh, one of my, one, I, you know, I met a couple of students, but one of my, my main students was this guy named Christian Rios, who I own Dreamanoids with. And uh, this guy like really gave me the lay of the land of San Antonio. He was from the south side. I was from the north side. And, um, and I just learned a whole lot about um, San Antonio. Like I learned about the car scene which I think y'all uh, y'all saw, I, you know, that's what I studied. And one of the things that was like really different and kind of signifies the difference between San Antonio and, um, and, Aust uh, and Austin is that in Austin, when we would go street race, uh, you'd have the fa some of the fastest people in the world come to race. And, uh, and when they would race up on 183 and go over like 200 miles an hour, um, they were just racing for fun. Like they were literally doing it to see who could be the fastest and that was it. But in San Antonio, it was like people were racing for money. Everybody not only had the right to carry, but like practice that right um, in terms of uh, like intimidation. And so it was a very kind of uh, heavy handed space where you didn't want to disrespect other people. And there was a lot more at stake than just having the fastest car. And so, um, that kind of like <laughs> sums up San Antonio in that uh, everything is not what you think when you come to San Antonio. And, and, um, and to me, having this new challenge, uh, I didn't know at the time. Uh, I, did, I honestly didn't know until uh, probably since until I got to College Station uh, how different San Antonio was from Austin. 
And, uh, and slowly what happened to me was that I just started dealing with more and more real issues in San Antonio. So I actually, uh, early on, I was still doing like cyber liberty work, but by the time I was leaving San Antonio, I had dealt with my university shooting and killing one of my best students, um, at his apartment, uh, on his way home, pulled over by a cop that, um, uh, was on a burger run and felt like he needed to, uh, play, uh, you know, this cop hero. And, um, and so I went from kind of this theoretical space in Austin where I was getting to explore and do things and kind of have agency in the digital space to, you know, having vigils, um, you know, working with students to protest, uh, working with the, the students who passed away's family, um, and at the same time, maintaining my job as like a tenure track professor at this university and doing scholarship and family and all these other things. And, um, and I was experiencing a lot of other real things that were going on. Um, I had a, a, another student whose father had passed away that was a police officer and had worked on the DWI unit for 20 years and, you know, never had to shoot at anybody because they knew how to deescalate and, and do things properly and had proper training. And so I, I, you know, I had this, uh, like visceral yin and yang of, of how to feel about things. And, and, and what it really kind of developed me into is kind of this centrist where, um, I just had a lot of different feelings about things. And, um, and that's where I kind of really started to develop kind of who I am today was, uh, I kind of went to San Antonio and, you know, I never thought one, I would ever move back there, but two, that. I would go through all these visual experiences and, um, and then come out working at Texas A&M, having been at, at um, UT Austin for all those years. And, uh, and I came here and I expected it to be this like bumpkinville. And, um, and in a way it is, <laughs> it totally is. But, uh, uh, but my school and my department are not. And, uh, and that's been like this crazy thing where I work with like some of the most supportive, uh, colleagues that I've ever seen period, and, you know, UT pale in comparison to that. And, um, and now work with people that work on civil liberties and work on hacktivism. Um, there's a, a professor that I work uh, with named Patrick Burkhart, uh, here that, um, you know, is a renowned, uh, uh author for cyber liberties. And, um, you know, he, he's written multiple books and studied multiple spaces, you know, why hackers win power and disruption in the network society, uh, pirate politics, the new information policy, uh, contests and, uh, music and cyber liberties. Like, you know, he was someone that even before I started working at AM, I was able to bring students up and have meet with, him and get to experience kind of these, you know, these, these discussions, uh, like one of the times when LulzSec, if anybody remembers LulzSec from like, I think that was like 2012 era, something like that. When the PSN network kept getting taken down, one of my, my students, uh, Christian was like really into gaming at the time. And so we started studying LulzSec and figuring out all the different players on Twitter that were like creating like the first generation of anonymous. If you remember the first, gen, you know, of anonymous, not, not, not a, a, a non Q, which is what we're, we're dealing with these days, which has a whole nother like political space and, and, uh, and realm to it. But this is what kind of back in the 4chan days. And, um, and so, you know, I was still having like these visceral experiences, but they just had all these different connotations to it. So all that to say, um, I was, you know, I ran this program at, uh, at uh, uh, UIW, the University of Incarnate Word, which is where my student was uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, murdered. And, uh, but I got to teach a lot of amazing students. And I got to work with a lot of amazing people and got to have a lot of cool experiences because of the handful of people that I got to meet in San Antonio that were just amazing. Like, um, this, uh, this person I would highly suggest you have, but would be very shy to do it. And as a colleague of Brandon Wiley's, uh, Jeremy Zunker, um, this guy, Jeremy Zunker, I met, uh, at a hacker space. I was working on a project for the Institute of Texan cultures. And, um, 
one of the things about me is that uh, the way I'm a genius, which I am, is that I admit that I don't know anything and I know when to ask for help. That was like my biggest thing. But I figured out geniuses do is that they just beat their head harder against things than anybody else. And it looks quick, but they're having just as much of a hard time. They just keep going and going. And so what I figured out to do was like, okay, I may not be a genius myself, but I know to just go and ask for help and talk to people and, um, whoops, and, uh, and, and seek out information. And so that's what, that's like, if, if there's any way that I'm a genius, it's just that I figured out to keep uh, 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 asking and asking. Let me see if I can spell converging correctly. There we go. Um, and, uh, and I ran into this guy, um, Jeremy Zunker, and, uh, and he, actually I can come over here. Where is it? I have it somewhere here. And Joey, I'll just say that, uh, yeah, we totally be down to have Jeremy on if you can talk him into doing it. So, uh, feel free to suggest. Yeah, well, um, yeah, no, well, you know, I'm going to, uh, kind of explain him here in a second. If I can get this, I don't want to cry. I'm going to like crash my. I have the one article I thought I had open that I, I don't seem to have open because I opened a bunch um, is uh, right here. So um, I went to the Hope Conference in 2018, which is uh, Hackers of Planet Earth. It's a 2600 group uh, meetup. And, um, and it was because uh, at the time I was uh, unemployed. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was trying to figure things out. And Jeremy... Uh, who I met, like I said, uh, working on this project here, which I'll show you here, um, offered to uh, let me go with him. And I was just like, you know, uh, Jeremy and I like became like this over the years. And, um, and so he, he took me with him and I had never been, he had been multiple times. This is actually uh, at the Institute of Texan Cultures in San Antonio back in the day. And what Jeremy helped me do was I knew I, I could use a connect to do interactive uh, motion capture and, uh, and input. And so what we wanted to do was show textiles like clo uh, text and clothing designs and have people be able to swipe back and forth. And I had downloaded the Microsoft SDK to do it. And, uh, but I had no idea how to actually program it and make it work. And that's where uh, Jeremy came in and um, I was like, yeah, I can do that. And so that's what we did. And, and what was really amazing is, um, you know, he ended up giving presentations. This is actually Brandon and, and Jeremy right here. Uh, they gave a presentation about the projects they were working on at the time. Jeremy gave a talk about um, how he visited China uh, for, I think, uh, around three weeks um, uh, during that time and uh, looked at all the hacker spaces and manufacturing resources uh, that were available there. And... Um, and then what ended up happening was I ended up uh, going on this adventure with him to um, the Hope Conference in 2018. And um, we ended up working at this one little space in the, in the conference for hours and hours and hours. And um, we uh, were working with this guy named Scotty who runs uh, Strange Parts, which if you've Never heard of Strange Parts. It's a really cool, and well, in my opinion, it's a really cool YouTube channel. Um, uh, Strange Parts. And uh, what he does is um, he kind of takes apart, uh, literally, uh, the manufacturing process of components and kind of demystifies it uh, through his journeys, both in the U.S. and in China. And... Uh, Jeremy had met him and uh, and at that time we were working on some RFID tag antennas and so Jeremy built the board of directors which was a I think it's called a yogi antenna I could be wrong and um, and we were just meeting all kinds of people like this guy uh, came and w wanted to do some surface mount uh, soldering and learned how to do it and we were talking to him and, and he was like I'm the uh, yagi there we go uh, I'm the, I'm the IBM mainframe kid. And we were like, okay. And, uh, if you type in IBM, uh, mainframe kid, uh, it's an actual, like, yeah, he's, he's the mainframe kid. 
actually it's funny i've had people come up to me and be like have you heard of that kid with the mainframe i'm like hi like that's that's me and so like evidently this guy had built a mainframe in in the in the depths of his parents uh uh basement and then ended up doing a bunch of research and work for ibm like kind of i guess through the public public publicization i can't talk right now of uh of kind of the work agenda funny enough he has that same shirt on which i'm sure he probably has on today as well um so anyways uh i kind of like i got reinvigorated and through um some other work you know i uh i was mixing art and hacktivism together heavily i was teaching it to my students so I was taking students that were uh, communication arts majors, which basically was like a liberal arts degree and having um, not learned to code and not learn to do hardware, but to explore code and explore hardware, meaning I never made them do anything. I would just be like, here are the things that I've been looking into. Here's a makey makey. Here's an Arduino. Here is a, uh, um, you know, uh, processing, which if I remember correctly is what you used to, to program, um, Arduinos with. And, uh, um, you know, my students would go on and, and create. So like, uh, this student learned to like use a, a MIDI synth to build, uh, uh or not build, but compose keyboard cat, uh, on a raspberry Pi. And she was just like, so excited. And, um, and that was something that would occur over and over again was that I would work with students and we would develop these things. And, um, and then, uh, I would circle back with act labbers and, um, and we would, uh, plan out like Kevin here, Kevin, you're somewhere. Oh, there's Kevin right there. Uh, Kevin, uh, got to attend, uh, our 2018 act lab, uh, conference. And, um, and we would have, you know, hardware show and tells, we would have uh, software presentations, uh, hacker art that people were working on, and um, and different people come and speak and and talk about initiatives that they're doing. So basically, kind of like EFF, but uh, a little bit more beyond um, just just some of the uh, uh, um, I guess ACLU style, like like uh, Kevin talks about uh, focus. There, the internet um, there's a uh, there's a large venn diagram overlap between the two but there's there's some yeah. topics that we talk about that act lab wouldn't be interested in and vice versa but there's a strong yeah, overlap. for sure <laughs> yeah and so you know we had a, uh, a, a, a former act lab student that came and did these uh, photos where he had a, a flash going through the backing of this camera and um and that's what like made uh uh that he had synced with his digital camera and would put this like kind of gobo looking uh, uh, logo behind us when we were taking our, our photos for fun. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of the idea was, you know, we've always been kind of from like entrepreneurship to art. And, um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of like my hacker side. So let me talk about, um, some of my like community work that I do, like this is San Arte. This was a, a uh, I document a lot of projects. I document heavily. I always have a camera on me. I'm always like, that's one of the things I love to do. So like this, you know, just happened to be happening. Um, I had a, a colleague that I had met from uh, a, a digital inclusion meetup who was the coordinator for Google, the Google Community Builder in, in San Antonio. And uh, I ended up, uh, she ended up calling me and asking me if I could, you know, they would pay me to like cover their thing. And I was like, you don't need to pay me. That event is happening a block from my shop, which is located on the west side of San Antonio, which is one of the poorest zip codes in the, in the nation. And, um, and she was putting on this kind of like a, uh, well, it's called San Arte, and it was like this kind of healing uh, event where they were doing, uh, they had like curanderas and they had like uh, 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 limpias and, and like different kinds of food and, and kind of preventive uh, medicine. And one of them was a pharmacist that worked for the pharmacy, uh, but like it's also kind of this, um, I don't know, just more than a pharmacist, if that makes any sense at all. 
and and has other motives for for why she does what she does in life and uh, and so i went in like um recorded this and documented it and um this uh this kind of of work is something that i've merged over time so this wasn't the first one i ever did uh, or the last but um but what i what i one of the projects that merged between like this art thing that I'm really into and uh, like digital hacktivism was uh, this this initiative called open um, ed essay.org which I founded in like 2015 just as like a I don't know a harebrained project it started off with mapping but also worked with uh, which I don't even know if the, yeah, the mapping doesn't even work right now um, I was trying to map out like uh, steam based resources in San Antonio but um, but what I ended up you know doing was what I love to do, which was like documenting projects and and initiatives where people are working in different parts of San Antonio to develop um, uh, equitable um, experiences for uh, uh, the citizens of San Antonio. And so it's, it it pretty much all started with this article called the Pizza Slice, which was I looked at a bunch of GIS data with imagine that Jeremy Zunker who showed me the GIS data and, uh, and we started looking at it and we realized that the most affluent, most Republican, most, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, conservative side of San Antonio existed between Bernie downtown of San Antonio and Bolverde, which is like, uh, there's this, uh, a highway called 46 that goes between them. And, uh, and we developed this thing called the pizza slice theory, which is like, this is the richest, most, you know, prominent part of San Antonio. And actually there's some like, uh, if, if we were to like redraw this a little bit more, there would be like just some random cheese spotted over here and some random cheese spotted over here. But all of this would still just be, you know, a, a red sauce and, um, and not very equitable. And so uh, what I started to do was kind of look at this data, share it with other people, host uh, conferences about this through using the bar camp model. And people from Austin would come down and talk about like not only digital equity, but, um, but how we can think about uh, what I called um, advocacy over charity. Meaning I would rather have a hundred thousand people help me than get a hundred million dollars to work on a project or a billion dollars really. I'll, like I would rather get a hundred thousand people, citizens of my city to work on a project collectively than to have a billion dollars given to the city to work on a project, if that makes sense. And so that was kind of like the premise. And so what I, what I went and did was I went and researched a bunch of different places that are like trying to do things that are very participatory in this way. And like one of the random ones I found was in what we call a cultural desert, a space that is, um, doesn't have a lot of cultural resources, libraries, stores, uh, or tiendas or, you know, places that have like a, um, a rounded kind of experience. And, uh, it was the best by teen tech center, um, at the, uh, family services, um, center, which was like an old elementary school on the, on the far west side of San Antonio, a uh, far inner west side of San Antonio, I should say. Um, and, uh, and what we did was like, um, I went to this like mentoring event and I ended up, um, with a bunch of colleagues from San Antonio, not colleagues as in professors, but colleagues as in other advocates that I met, um, we're able to start like a dialogue and engagement with the community to like learn about um, health, learn about um, uh, entrepreneurship, open source software development, um, now website development, commerce and all kinds of things. Cause these students had the resources and um, they had have like screen printing and just all kinds of things. And their curriculum was really interesting in that they too, weren't teaching people how to code. They were making it available for students to learn how to code. And their curriculum was based off of a uh, um, uh, curriculum developed out of MIT. And so it was really, really interesting. And then, you know, I would just go and document all kinds of events and projects. Like uh, this is a, a um, <clears throat> what they call a Fandango, uh, which uh, has to do with uh, like a Mexican, um, 
I call it the Mexican drum circle, but what it is is uh, it's people with jaranas, with guitars, and uh, they meet up and they play music together. And I was really interested in like this youth-oriented, family-oriented meetups where you create community and how you can create um, an, an organic feeling for community building in the home and, and what that has to do. Cause like, these are things that I think about even when I'm thinking about digital advocacy and digital rights and digital movements, because ultimately these things meet, right? M-A-A-T, right? They like, they're, they are people. So uh, another project I worked on was with this uh, Academy Award um, nominated uh, a stop motion animator from Detroit, this guy, uh, uh, Gary Schwartz where uh, we went in uh, to all, we went to like 11 schools in nine days and did stop motion animation um, projects with them and taught them about stop motion. And uh, he was um, uh, awarded a grant to come. And uh, he and I and this guy, Victor Zuniga, who ran an after school program for uh, an apartment complex on the east side of San Antonio, uh, worked with his uh, st his kids that did the after school program, as you can see there, they were having a great time, and uh, and we developed using uh, projectors and a digital camera, and of course Jeremy was there helping out too. Um, this stop motion that was all analog until we took you know the video part, and uh, and then uh, we worked with a local um, video company that uh like a gig like huge like gobo lights automated dmx kind of video company to uh display this at this festival called luminaria and um and kind of give the students this this experience of having like gotten to tangibly make things and, and do make an imprint in a space that they typically don't get to experience and so um so yeah uh, let me close these out. Uh, that's opened.org or openedsa.org. Let me post that there. And um, and that kind of leads us to me being at A&M now. I have a bunch of other art projects and things that I've done. Like with this student project, we did Going Big, which was we built like this 36, like the students built a 36 foot screen and we used uh, three projectors to project onto it, and then they developed their artworks to go onto it and uh, display their content. And that was like in, I don't know, 2015, there we go. Uh, done like uh, work with this guy named uh, Mark Barnett on design thinking and doing Makey Makey implementations using like cardboard materials to develop interfaces, again, using empathy learning and um, and stuff like that. So I've, I just, I have this really big background in this space. And, um, and so I guess to kind of bring us to today, uh, what happened was I got invited to this book club, um, the rise of big data policing, which I didn't own the book for the first meeting. I, I ordered it post <laughs> first meeting and David, uh, who's, uh, one of our co-hosts here, um, you know, uh, facilitated this meetup. And, uh, and that's when I got my gears going again, thinking about cyber liberties and thinking about um, kind of living in the meat in these uh, virtually virtuous days. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, we're, we're in a crazy time right now. We're in a crazy time on many levels. We're, we're in, a, in a situation that we can't stop. Uh, we're in a situation that um, is very suffocating for a lot of people. Um, we're in, we're in a situation where uh, our technologies have definitely gotten out of hand and uh, we can't reel them in and uh, we're facing the ramifications of it. And so um, there's a, a, at the individualist level, there's a huge loss of a uh, feeling of agency and, uh, and some would argue there is no agency left, right? That's like one of the things Kevin and I were kind of uh, talking loosely about before we started the meeting was, you know, how do we bring back agency? How do we bring back that feeling of 
I would say hope, but then people think Obama, right? And I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm apolitical in many ways, uh, or I try to be. Um, and that doesn't, and I'm not, don't mean that because I'm not trying to offend people. I can offend you, but it just means that that is really like, earnestly, I'm, I just am, I'm, I don't believe in the Democrats or Republicans and a lot of other things. Um, and so, you know, we're in this space right now where, um, we have all these tools, we have all this technology. We as individuals have the ability to, uh, I was talking to, to Kevin about this before we started to create, not just uh, digitally, but like, you know, we're still gonna have humans coming. Like you can procreate and procreation is still happening. And in the most basic of sense, like people are still being born, okay? And so we can, we can feel that our society is over but there were there there were still be people coming our way, and uh, and to me that's where uh, I mean I talk about hope and I talk about kind of like this uh, this idea that maybe some of us that are some of the biggest naysayers and some of the biggest pessimists about our ability to kind of uh, deal with the societal implications of tracking ourselves constantly in a big data way so i have like this uh, little video i made um about big data i don't know if i have my uh let me go to youtube studio i explain big data and, and i think i exp oh, i don't know who knows if i can explain it better right now but i'll just play it for you if it comes up explaining whoops big data in 30 seconds it's a 14 minute video right isn't that funny so uh, we'll just listen the first minute. All right, so big data in under 30 seconds. Phone, phone has lots of information. It has my geolocation, it has all my phone calls, my text messages, my data. When I go right, I have a heart rate monitor. It has all of these things. That's our y-axis. Time, we have all of this time. One day, a second, uh, you know, a minute, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a year, 20 years. We're constantly creating this data and creating information here. What's big data? The Z access. The access of having all of these phones, all of these people generating all of that information all at once, and companies and governments being able to create big data sets that triangulate and poly hierarchically create data sets based off of all of that information. All right, so that was actually 48 seconds, so I still failed at the 30 second thing. but. Um, you know, in this video, what I go on to do is break down kind of what I mean by all of this and the implications of it, because uh, that video is made for like all the way from the lay to like the most expert of, of big data. And, um, and, you know, what I'm really asserting there is that what we're not used to and what we're still training our brains to understand is the fact that we're being uh, catered to not by what we're doing, but by everything around us literally like who's in this meeting who's you know how how we're being tracked all of our phones all of our cars all of our you know uh um, technologies that we're using so so for example uh, i always like to use myself as the example because i'm not hurting anybody but me right as uh you know i give a lot of information away uh, Brandon kind of remembers I was horrible at like actually using like uh, PGP and and uh, um, all the encryption things and uh, that we would use for email or for uh, messaging and things like that. And um, you know, in 2010, I gave a talk about how all of our information is already gone. And in 2020, you know, our information is is beyond gone. Um, it's being harvested in ways that like you don't have to exist digitally that there can still be a profile just because of all the other people that exist around you if that makes sense and um and so for me you know i look at it two ways one i always have a critical lens to it but i've also uh kind of lived my life um in a digital world so what do i mean by that uh i I have a couple of things that I'm working on in life that I've actually kind of gone full kind of head first into 
uh, exploring at a personal level, not at a, uh, like a research level. And uh, one of those things is my health. So I have like, uh, I'm a type two diabetic. I have high blood pressure. I've always been obese since I was like 50, uh, probably like 10. And, um, and that's something I've always had to kind of face. And so my, like my biggest push, my most recent push, like that I released today is that, um, you know, I got a glucose monitor cause like I was in denial for like the past like 10 years of being an adult with uh, di uh, diabetes. And, um, I finally started tracking my blood sugars and I also bought like this Bluetooth enabled, um, scale, right? Because like at the end of the day, I am a data fiend and I want to know like what's going on with me. And so, uh, I kind of want to show you all a couple of things of like what that means. And then I understand that this data is being proprietarily shared and harvested. And I don't know how I feel about it. I just know I want to do this because like, it's literally a way for me to get my health in gear, if that makes sense. So for the past, uh, I guess, you know, since January 4th, so eight days, I've been like monitoring my weight through this uh, app, right? And you can see like it offers a rich amount of data. I'm gonna, actually, let me scroll through that slower, okay? So you can kind of see the different kinds of data it offers, All right? And uh, like I'm over here, I'm all happy because I'm like eight pounds down. Um, but I've been kind of documenting and managing my uh, information here. And, um, you know, that's one app I'm using. Another app that I use heavily is this uh, app called Strava. So I have uh, what you call a trainer and it's uh, digitally enabled. It has a, uh, a cadence uh, um, device. It has a power meter that measures how much, how many Watts I'm putting out when I pedal. And, uh, and I have a heart rate monitor hooked up to it. So when I look at one of these rides here, it'll tell me, you know, general information. But if I click on here, it'll tell me the speed that I rode at, my cadence, my heart rate, right? And then um, it'll actually tell me my zones, my power output. So it literally like documents my power. And, uh, and then again, my zones. And then if I ride in, in the, in the, in the meat, right. As, as I call it, uh, which I have to actually look back because I, I, I rarely get to ride in the meat these days. Uh, meaning in person on the ground, like my bike moving through the wind. Uh, I'll also get my elevation information. And so it has like GPS information and, uh, Strava actually, um, has teamed up with many municipalities to share their information to help develop biking trails and resources for people to um, be able to make arguments for more green spaces and things like that. Um, they do licensing, but I show you these apps, not because I'm like, Hey, look at these apps. Like, this is amazing. This is what, you know, what you all should be downloading and using. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's not what I'm advocating for. My assertion today is that I think we need to think back to the mid 2000s and think about, you know, I'm not a programmer, but how do we as a society of makers, doers, and of teachers create a generation that's coming and mobilize our generations that are to believe in open source software development to create apps that aren't garnering all my data that, sh you know, I can track my blood sugar with and not feel like I'm uploading it to someone that's going to try and sell me uh, sugary snacks over and over again to like defeat me on my purpose of, of this R2 uh, figure out, you know, ways to affect me with uh, prescriptions and things like that. You know, how do I, you know, how do we come together and think as a collective to, um, determine open big data standards. And, uh, and again, like there are people that are doing these things. I don't want to belittle that. I am literally just making my own assertions here. I'm not trying to, uh, to, um, like think that 
nothing is going on in these spaces. There's a ton going on in these spaces. But um, I've just noticed lately that a lot of times um, we, uh, we kind of get down and, and start forgetting uh, how my brother developed Stra Strava. Yeah. Um, Y'all might be interested in a uh, precursor, a secure mobile device. Yeah. Thanks. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, I, I'm looking at all of, all of these apps that are coming out and the apps that I've been using. And I'm like, I'm just thinking like, you know, in La La Land in Austin and in San Francisco and in all these different spaces where people are being able to worry about these things. Um, you know, how do we create a culture again that values development and ownership of information? Now, the irony here, at least for me personally, is that <laughs> I know the Republicans and these right wing Trump nuts uh, for anybody that supports Trump here. I'm sorry, uh, are also wondering this issue now. You know what I mean? Like how they can control their data and understand open platforms and, and have the ability to awful skate and. I don't know. They're suddenly worried about the big tech platforms I've been streaming about for years. I'm like, well, welcome to the party. Yeah. Five years late. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like. A really interesting time right now to kind of watch uh, people be like, what? Like, this is not Publix? Like, oh, this is all private. This is all like beer. You're all getting to drink beer for free. And for free, we mean by that Z access, we get to have that Z access and we own your ass, you know, and, and, uh, and we own your agency. Like your ability to have agency is, is mediated through us. And, uh, and so it makes for a really interesting time. It makes for um, some visceral discussion, and that's what I'm hoping we can have. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll stop here and just ask if there are questions. Um, but like, I, you know, one thing I want to make very clear just right off the bat is, one, I don't consider myself an expert. I just consider myself someone who thinks. Um, and two, like most of anything that sounded intelligible were because, um, like I said, I surround myself by really intelligent people. And um, I just, that's my, that's my intelligent part is that I just know to ask other people for help. Um, so a lot of answers to these questions may be me referring to other people. So, yeah. Well, that was a very wide ranging, interesting, unique discussion. Um, it's, uh, it's really quite fascinating how many different areas of interest you synthesize. Um, do we have any uh, questions for Joey? Um, I'll come up with some if we don't, but I do tend not to like to hold the spotlight on these. So yeah, does anybody have a question for Joey? And if people are being shy, I can kick it off. I will say that it was uh, one time I was uh, invited to give a TED talk, a TEDx talk, I should say, for San Antonio. And um, it was really interesting. You know, I had a bunch of people encourage me to apply because they were like, we want to hear you talk. So I said, okay, I'll apply. I applied and they asked me to come give a talk. And, um, and I went to their like curation meeting and, uh, the way I, you know, the way I present today was, is that's how I've always presented my whole life. I just tab up things and talk. And man, I went to that meeting and they were just like, you can't do that. Like, you just can't do that. Like, we have rules and we have ways of doing things. And this is just crazy. And so I ended, I ended up telling them, like, okay. And they were like, well, what do you mean, okay? I'm like, okay, like, I just won't do it. And they're like, but th this is your chance. This is TEDx San Antonio. I was like, yeah, that's cool. Like, I'll see you guys later. And, um, and I always kind of have felt that way about, you know, institutions that, that clamor to a name more than clamor to sincerity, you know, and, and, uh, I, all that to say, thank you for letting me give the kind of talk that I like to give. I, I, yeah, any, I, any I feel that we're, you know, we, there's a bazillion meetups and a bazillion different talk series. We, we don't have any point to exist if we don't document the actually interesting things people are doing and working on and thinking in this space right now. So, yes, mm. I want the people that TEDx doesn't want. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, he asked, what are you working on right now? Yes. Um, so my... So my latest thing that I'm working on and I'm about to release my YouTube video on and I released it on Facebook, it's public on Facebook, is 
Um, I'm working on this curriculum based off of fear and failure and teaching people um, how to be creative using fear and failure. Now, let me preface that. I don't mean by like putting fear into people and failing them. I mean that we have a lot of fear, especially right now, like with the students I'm teaching or small business owners or entrepreneurs or other people, like we have, we live in a fear-based society right now. Um, all of our media works off of fear. Um, how we feel like we're getting through the day often is based off of fear. And then failure is, you know, something that we fear and, and it's something that we go through. And so basically um, what I, what I learned myself was that I was always thinking I needed to be perfect. I was always thinking I needed to be doing what was right. And if I wasn't doing what was right, I was a failure rather than understanding that um, I am always going to fail. And uh, maybe it's more about progressing and focusing on my progressions and learning from my failures than it was so much about what I did wrong and harping on that. And um, that sounds cheesy, it sounds simple, but to develop a curriculum around it is uh, gonna take a little bit of work on my part, but really what it is, is it kind of harkens back to the ACT Lab days of creating a safe space and getting people to understand that um, we are at a heightened level of anxiety in general. Like I suffer from anxiety personally, and I don't mean like just casually. I mean, I take Citalopram for it and I have a prescription for Xanax and like, you know, I've done uh, uh, blog posts um, or vlogs where I've talked about it. So it's not like a private thing. I'm very open about it and, um, and kind of explored, you know, how even though I can be productive for six hours, I can also have six hours where I'm just having an anxiety attack. And so to everybody else that doesn't know me, they just look and they see, oh man, you got all this stuff done. You did all these things today, blah, blah, blah. And they don't understand that I also spent that time. So what I'm trying to do is kind of go like, okay, Joey, you've experienced these things. You're going through this. How do we break down the objections, right? Like selling, like how I learned how to do sales from Creston Funk back in my hi-fi days. And, and create a space where people feel comfortable speaking about their fears and speaking about their failures in an effort to uh, create radical trajectory for them in what they want to endeavor on, whatever that is, right? Because like I, we, we, we intentionally say make stuff, okay? Because if we knew what that stuff was, it wouldn't be new media. It wouldn't be internet-based. And so, uh, and to give you all an idea of how I teach, it's really simple. I take something you're interested in, okay? I take some theory and skills, okay? This is the cheesy part, okay, you all ready? We take your heart, okay? We take all three of those things and we rub them together and we make stuff, okay? It's that simple. And I facilitate it. And, uh, and it's funny cause like I'll have a lot of serious colleagues like, um, oh, that doesn't work. That does well. And I'm like, look, like I've been doing it for 15 years. Like I'm not asking if it works. I'm just telling you what I do. And if you don't think it works, come to my class, come hang out, come see what's going on and, uh, and you'll see what's happening. So, uh, let me see. Did any, I, I, mean, I really enjoy the art. <laughs> you know, I just, I'll just add on to that, Joey, but I, I think, you know, as somebody who's failed a lot in my life, I think you're right on track about uh, failing is a great way to learn new stuff. We actually, uh, uh, my uh, eighth grader Forrest, we had a, a big project in one of his classes where he was like, I want to build a hexagonal wood bench around a tree. And I know nothing about woodworking, but we just took it as an opportunity to learn how to do it. And there's now a hexagonal wood bench around a tree at his school. So I, I think, I think you've, you know, I, I think more teachers need to take a page to your approach, frankly. Well, and, and I just, I think about teaching. I think about college. I think about how much of a farce college is right now or the university is. It's a joke, you know, um, and I say that as someone that's benefiting from the teat of financial aid. As somebody, I don't mean that who, shouldn't have as somebody who went to a quote unquote but, elite school, I could complain about higher education for quite a while and how we do it. Um, so what I'm trying to do is 
Uh, I'm always trying to create radical trajectory for my students, and I'm always trying to figure out the intangibles for which are for which are being uh, either inadvertently or advertently excluded from the collegiate experience. Like one of the most simple ones is like, how do you get a job when when you graduate? Like most uh, bachelor uh, uh, programs don't even have a class at the end of the at the end of the experience that teach you how to go and find a job. I mean. <laughs> You may think that, oh, well, I don't need that. It's like a uh, first-generation college student, you know, students that don't have parents that both went to college, like they don't know how to go and do that. They don't know how they're going to pay their financial aid back. They don't know about insurance. They don't know about a lot of different things that, like, we take for granted, you know, developing a six-month plan and a five-year plan and, like, understanding job versus career and, like, all of those things that sound like a technical vocation thing are things that, are becoming uh, 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 so important. And then on top of that, thinking about it in this COVID space now, right? In this, like not COVID as in the disease, but as in the cultural and social phenomena, like how do we get people employed? What's considered networking? What's considered, you know, and again, dealing because again, that's the fear, that's the anxiety. That's like, you know, even as professionals, like how, you know, all, all that are professionals, how do you go and find another job right now? You lose your job, what are you going to do? Right. Like, how are you going to go find it? Like, how do we create dialogues and ways of people feeling like they can they can work through those issues? I have a question that's kind of related to that. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, there's all awesome talk. I love it. Um, I love all that the hacking, the tinkering, the, the art the activism. That's like what I've been interested in. I've been trying to work on, but it is obviously been lonely recently. Like, and you can't go meet up with people in the real world. <laughs> where do you find like these communities where you can get together people right now, I guess online, but even going forward um, in the future in person, where can you go? Like you said, surround yourself by really intelligent people um, in order to take part in this kind of stuff and, and learn and grow. So that's a great question. And that's one that I've been thinking about um, heavily because uh, you're right. Like it, it is, it is, um, at this time, it's really hard. Now, some spaces that I would consider is like, say I was in Austin right now, right? And you were like, uh, I don't know if, are you in Austin or no? Yes. Yep. I am in Austin. I would be like, oh, uh, is it called Data Geek? I believe uh, there's a, a space there called Data Geek. I would look that up. I would look up all the hacker spaces. Uh, um, I will, I will second find it. Data Geek is a wonderful Austin-based group that if you're interested in art and technology and hacker stuff and the intersection it's you couldn't ask for a better program i've uh i've taken one of their classes and i actually built my own analog uh, modular synthesizer that my uh, good friend mickey delp uh taught the class it, it's a wonderful resource and you'll definitely you know, meet um, people in this space if you hang around that community now the other thing i'll say is that um again with anxiety and and uh and kind of fears everybody has a different level of of how they want to engage right now right so i have friends that are you know they get the groceries put to the corner and and they don't go outside and they don't see anybody else and i have some friends that are like you know crazy i, I call them crazy but like you know no mask go everywhere like they don't care blah 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 and um and for me personally, like uh, I, you know, I wear my masks all the time in public and stuff, but I do have people that I like COVID with, as I call it, um, like my colleague, uh, Jonathan Guajardo, I COVID with him. And so uh, we, we started a barbecue channel during COVID. So we barbecue together. Uh, we made ribs tonight. They were awesome, by the way. And, um, and so, you know, you maybe you can find someone that you can have an interaction with. Now, if you're not able to do that, I have intermediary friends that I meet up with, right? That will go to an outdoor coffee shop. We'll sit six or more feet apart and we talk and hang out. Now, some people would be like, Joey, you're going to get the vid. Okay. Like you're going to die. And I'm going to be like, maybe I, I, I don't know, but I do know that my wife, you know, teaches uh, here in, in College Station uh, elementary school and, and physically, and my kid physically goes to school because that's what they're doing here. 
and uh, they all wear masks all day. They all have little like acrylic see-through uh, uh, partitions around them, and uh, and so that's my reality. Now, is my reality right? And you know, their their assessment for um, for COVID exposure is that you have to have been with the person within six feet for 15 minutes or more without a mask, and if that didn't occur, then you can go back to work, or your kid can be in the classroom. And so, you know, what we think of as like, because I, I have a friend that I ride with virtually, right, on my on my trainer, I've been riding with for the past week, and he's in Seattle, and like, those just aren't options. Like, you can't go and do those things. They can't. The kids don't, you know, get to go and do that. So it's it's uh, in terms of meeting up in person, I think it is a, a big challenge. Uh, I think e the EFF meetup is good. I think um, again, I'm gonna uh, give props to uh, David for hosting a great book club. That meetup was great. I host meetups um, through the uh, uh, New Media Lab, and um, I'll we have a Facebook. <laughs> I don't have a website yet. We have a Facebook group. Oh, one Our, other uh, Facebook uh, page. One other local uh, group that I believe is doing at least some virtual meetings during all this right now, but it's usually in person, like us. That's Austin based. As you might check out the local Nerd Night community. Um, a lot of uh there's a lot of overlap uh, there i've given a talk there a few times um brandon's given talks there and it's definitely uh it's another community that yeah there's a lot of overlap and you would meet like blinded people i mean i would definitely say once COVID's over come to our meetups in person go to nerd night go to these things you know they're, they're definitely good places if you want to meet people on this wavelength which can you know be hard in normal meet space to find those people <laughs> But yeah, so um, so like the meetups that I've been hosting, I've probably hosted them every other month, and um, it's usually like anywhere between five and twenty people. Uh, I post them publicly; they're not like private. They're just you know only so many people <laughs> want to nerd out on stuff. But what we do is uh, we introduce ourselves, and then we talk about uh, any um, interesting projects we're working on, and kind of give people updates and and um, go from there. And so. It could be hardware, it could be software, it could be like someone's looking for a job. I mean, it's just all kinds of different people you know, like dealing with nerd life or, or, or creative life and, uh, and figuring things out. Like the last meeting we had, one of my, uh, one or one of our really creative, I see Brandon's on here, one of our really creative students is this guy named Jason Wynn, who when we met him uh, and, and showed up to class, he was like, I'm the Asian cowboy. And we we're like, I think that's racist, but you're saying it and you're reading to me. So, all right, we'll roll with this. And, but that's not what we were really thinking. But if we were teaching today, that's what we would think. Uh, uh, you know, this was like an 05. And uh, we were like, okay. And so he's like, no, really. And he gets up on our table and like falls off the table and gets up and then falls flat on his face on the table and then like gets up and then falls and hits a chair and gets up. And we're like, oh, wow. Like, you're like a stunt man. And he's like, yeah, I'm a stunt man. Like I've, I've worked at six flags. And, um, and so I've since like, we've since watched him, uh, I helped him develop a business plan and pitch his own stunt show and get it approved and do it. And, you know, now he's uh, out in Hollywood. And so the last meeting we had, he was on there and I had students on there and I had uh, other colleagues and he was talking about uh, like COVID protocols for being on set because like he's on the Larry David show right now, like uh, uh, as an actor. And we were just like, oh, OK. So it's like you never know what you're going to get at our meetups. But um, usually it's interesting. And, and if it's not, you can make it interesting, right? Like, you, you know, you yourself with what you're doing, you know, bring it up and, and start chatting about it. But, um, you know, one of the things Sandy, our mentor from the act lab taught us was you know facilitation over dictation so um I, I try my best to not so much be someone that says this is what needs to happen at a meeting as much as to facilitate uh discourse if that makes sense and to that so end, yeah those are our meetups as i was Go just to say to that end as well um you know eff Austin, and i always say we are a community driven organization like we have a board of directors there's a uh, nine of us in total um, but, you know, I always say when people are like, hey, is EFF Austin doing this? And I'm like, no, we're not. But, you know, we totally could if you be the person to make that happen. You know, this is 
community driven and passion driven and believing the cause driven. So, I mean, you know, if, if we're not doing something that you're passionate about, I mean, just email me, we'd be happy to start a project around it. So, yeah. Um, I, yeah I, I remember uh, Jeremy, who's on here too, I think. Uh, also, uh, when we would go to the Timbit Works hackerspace in San Antonio, he would, people would say, you all should do this or do that. And, and Jeremy would always be like, well, that's great because this is a duocracy. So like, you know, you want to do it, do it. And they would be like, oh, okay. And I, and I definitely have felt that way about uh, EFF Austin. They've always been ones to kind of, if you come with an idea, you know, they're facilitative of it. And, um, and uh, you know, Dorkbot and, and Nerd Knight. I know Dirk, Dorkbot doesn't happen much right now. As I understand and, it, it's kind of defunct at the moment because it doesn't really right. have a stakeholder owner keeping it alive at this point, which is a shame because the talks were interesting. Yeah, well, I think, you know, Make Magazine kind of really ran over with the Maker Fairs all over uh, Dorkbot. And now and, Make uh, Magazine went bankrupt and there's no more Maker Fairs either, which makes me very sad. <laughs> Yeah, and so as a yeah, I, I, as an anthropologist, I studied all of these things and, and experienced it all. So it was really crazy. Uh, I just as a funny history, um, you know, Dorkbot in in, in Austin uh, was approached by you know Make Magazine, and uh, they pitched doing this uh, a festival together, and then they just never heard from Make Magazine again, and Make put on uh, Maker Fair. And so that's like kind of how, you know, proprietary versus open. And so you'll, you have a generation that doesn't know that. And we're just always huge fans of the Maker Fairs, not understanding that it was kind of like this closed sourced uh, hierarchical um, event rather than a community based event. Um, now, the mini Maker Fairs that have been occurring all over are like franchised. And, um, and so those are kind of more community based, but they're all independent now because, like Kevin said, like, went out of business well, it, and that it, was it, a very similar thing well i was gonna say it's frankly very similar to like comparing burning man versus regional burns now of like frankly the regional burns are far more what burning man used to be like before it was the billionaires drug fair <laughs> right and also kind of like um you know the difference between a hacker space and like tech shop if y'all remember tech shop or ever heard of tech shop tech shop was like ultimate be all end all um space and it was awesome i mean i loved it it was so cool i got to go there a lot uh with brandon but unfortunately they went under you know they they had to move out of austin and um that actually does remind me we do we do have atx hacker space as well which it's been quite a while since i've been over there um they're another community you could probably find like-minded people I will admit that you're definitely getting into the very intense end of the, the the nerd pool. Like they make me look very normal, but if you're really into this sort of stuff, you'll meet some very interesting people there. <laughs> and you know, in terms of of um, like hacktivism meetups and uh, and things like that, well, I mean, there's this EFF meetup that I've really enjoyed and. Uh, you know, I, I just encourage to kind of keep, keep coming, you know, uh, there's like one of the things I've seen so far in zoom meetups is that there's always different people that show up to meetings. Like as soon as you think, you know, everybody that's going to show up that month for whatever, whoever's putting whatever on, it's always different. Um, you know, this year I, or this past fall, I hosted a, a talk series, uh, called showing trajectory. And it was, um, three different uh, uh, pairs of people in three different spaces, one in academia, one set in academia, one in community engagement, and then the other in like uh, the new media field. And uh, it was amazing to see the analytics of, of how, you know, people that showed up in Zoom, we, uh, we did a live stream on Facebook and like, man, the live streams were just so large. Um, even like <laughs> another one that like, this is kind of weird, but it's like, you know, we had a vigil for my student that passed away and I put it on with uh, uh, his parents and um, his mom, you know, saw like maybe 10 people in, um, in the Zoom and was just kind of like, it was really cool. There were people from all over the nation that kind of showed up in that Zoom. There were like 10 of them. Um, 
but it was kind of small and she was kind of, you know, it was, it was an interesting, different kind of feel. And uh, when we explained to her that we were live streaming over Facebook and that there were 80 people watching as well, all of a sudden, um, you know, I had a different feel. And, and so I think about these visceral feels. I think about, you know, what does it mean to meet up? What does it mean to have been seen? What does it like, you know, um, I teach, you know, new media. So I often ask, what does it mean to have made it? What is, what's success on YouTube? What would you consider a successful YouTube channel? What would you consider having made it? You know, is it, I think the two biggest tech channels and in, in, in are Marquise Jones. Is it Marquise Jones? Marquise? I can't remember Marquise's last name and, uh, and Linus of tech tips. You know, they have around 13 million followers and, uh, and there's some others too that are around in that, in those teens. And, um, and then they pale in comparison to, you know, some other group and, and some other group. And, you know, there, there are, we, we, the other thing I, I talk about right now is that we live in, in a parallelism world, not a serial world. Like creation is happening in a parallel space. It's very rare that like, something is thought of uniquely that isn't influenced by things that are happening around them. And that it's not like some kind of collective phenomena, you know, we, we just, we're, we're kind of beyond that. And so, um, Paul says, I hope we'll get to join again. Thank you, Joey, for your presentation is great for people to still exist and the craziness we have fallen into. Yeah, no, it is. It is. We are in pure craziness. Um, anybody that thinks that we don't need to, be, be thinking we're not in craziness is, is crazy uh or to yeah. be thinking that yeah we're, we're in crazy it's it's nuts uh we don't i mean uh, uh, to be honest with you all i don't you know in terms of what's happened in the past two weeks um one i think all anybody that's here at the uh, eff meeting knew that this was going to happen or i hope you knew that this was going to happen i mean it wasn't like unforeseeable uh oh, they, <laughs> they'd me. only been talking they were going to do it for a month not even like in encrypted signal conversations so yeah, yeah. if you're surprised i don't know why <laughs> and also just you know we got to see systematic racism at the most uh stringent of ways we got to see systematic preference for uh normal what we consider normal americans um, to the point that like, I call it the uncle Jim syndrome, no offense to anybody named Jen. I'm not trying to make another Karen, but it's like, well, uncle Jim's just acting crazy. That's just uncle Jim. Oh, uncle Jim's just going to go and he's going to march. It's no big deal. Like uncle Jim's going to go do this. And it's like, uh, I think uncle Jim uh, is trying to have agency beyond what you think. And I'm using the word agency because you're going to find out what this means. And um, I also am very interested in this idea of this group of people, um, one, how they're being played, just like how, uh, in my opinion, again, these are my opinions, uh, okay. I feel like the left gets played, to, uh, of activists from the left get played as well. Uh, to I would play second the, that the as somebody fiddle. on the left. They get played in different ways, but <laughs> they succumb to their own played stupidity. The, they play the fiddle of, of, of the people in power and of the rich. And, um, and it's frustrating, but it's, to me, that's like a lot of what we're seeing is we're seeing people being activated, being coerced on both sides to have hatred, you know? And, and, um, as someone that like has friends on all sides of this, it's, um, it doesn't make me feel good either way. You know, I, I don't, uh, it's like, you know, what's the answer? Don't play, right? Like war games. Okay. If you ever saw that movie and they're playing tic-tac-toe. Okay. The answer is not to play the game. And because like in my head I go, okay, well, let's take, you know, a lot of people, well, let's take this all the way out. And I take it all the way out. And I'm like, what are people fighting for? People are fighting for the meaning of other people's agendas for which we don't locally even have a dispute over because we're not physically fighting over it right now, but for which, we think we need to because these other people have these agendas and um and it's a very kind of meta space um yeah everybody just lost the game yeah and we're gonna have to figure out how to regroup and um and so for me i've always been a centrist because like i really do believe in good i believe that um people can be inherently good and um 
as I've seen a lot of bad things happen in my life. I've seen people die like physically. I, um, have, uh, not always had the best experiences in terms of, um, racism. And I've also had people help me that would just, you know, you're going to help anybody. And, uh, and so, yeah, so in terms of, of what that means for what we're talking about today is that I think this information issue that we're facing is, uh, is going to be a, a humanizing experience. I think it's something that we're going to have to like circle back on and kind of regroup and, and understand what it means to be in the meat. I mean, that's why I named the talk the way I did, because, you know, I said living in the meat in these, you know, virtually virtuous days, meaning that everybody thinks that they're right. Everybody thinks they're correct. Everybody knows everything. Everybody can look up the source on the internet. We can construct truth to fix the way we see things to be correct. Yet we're still all fighting and we're still all having issues, even though we have truth at our digital fingertips. Right. And so, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, where I've kind of been at lately is, is trying to figure out, you know, how, how do we do this? Because before this happened, you know, I teach at a very conservative school, not like conservative as in my colleagues are conservative, but like my students, a lot of my students are very conservative, a lot of Trump supporters, you know? Um, and I don't have a problem with that. Like, that's not, that doesn't bother me. You know, uh, I, I see all kinds of things. I had some students like, I'll never forget, I, like, and I have these on my website. I have, you know, one student, te- uh, uh, here, I'll pull it up and I'll show you real quick. I think this will be kind of illustrate some of the, uh, it's probably this one over here. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, I remember that article. That was interesting. So, um, I had uh, two different students that were a really interesting juxtaposition of students in class. Um, one uh, woman, uh, uh, Alondra, did a, a, a whole piece about what it's like being a migrant farm worker and um, her experience doing migrant farm working and her, her family's perspectives of going out into the fields and working up north and doing that kind of work and then having um and i think his work is in here may not be i'll have to uh, i'll have to find it later um and then i had another student whose family owned a farm in 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 um uh, in central texas and we're talking about using uh, gps controlled uh, uh john deere machinery and what it's done to transform the farming experience and having them sitting next to each other, watching each other's videos and projects, talking about like their lived realities, you know, that's kind of like what excites me is, you know, the fact that I am in this space where we're having people that, like I said, are first generation college students and people that have been here for, for a long time. Like one of the unique things and weird things about me is that like, I've been told to go back to Mexico and people don't understand like, uh, in the literal sense, um, my ancestors signed the declaration of independence for Texas, like on two different people. And, um, and so when people tell me to go back to Mexico, I'm like, dude, y'all don't even know, like my, like I, I found, you know, my families are founders of Texas. It's a really different kind of take on things. And, um, and so it's, it's, you know, we're in a very like interesting space and maybe that's why I'm like considered like, uh, like a coconut or, or, you know, this guy that's like, I don't speak Spanish, but my last name is Lopez, but I understand like my background and understand the things that I've gone through. And, um, and in the digital world, you know, that has a whole nother connotation, you know, we're, we're dealing with identity politics. That's a whole nother thing that comes up. Um, another assertion I would make is that, uh, we are living in a space where uh, this is the last stand for the white man. And I don't mean that like in a radical way. I mean it as in, um, if you look at the people that are complaining the most about these issues, about identity politics, 
about all of the left, about BLM, about all of these issues, it's mainly white males um, and older white males. And even the people that um, are considered like, a, a, what would the word, I don't even, I don't have a word for it, but I'm thinking of like Ben Shapiro, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Joe Rogan, which like, I love listening to Joe Rogan. I actually taught a class called the Joe Rogan Experience. But these are all people that are like maintaining this space, this last stand of, of having that be the seminal opinions for how we disseminate and think about information. And that's just an observation. I'm not saying that's good, bad, or in between. Uh, it just depends on where you stand politically. But for me, it's one of those things where I just see um, how people are creating these various realities in our country and how they can have the convictions that they have no matter what side they're on because of the information they're being shown. And what really just gets me thinking is just the fact that we have all these private corporations that have the control over the Z access, have the control over how we sway and feel, let alone government agencies, right? Which love having that agency, right? But profit driven, it's just a whole nother uh, uh, level. And, um, and so we just, we live in this really interesting time. And that's why uh, in my talk, I, in my final assertion is like we, if we could, like my dream is that we take back open source software development. You know, when we start developing big data tools that are used open source software, when, when uh, I was in the book club, which is, you know, just ended this, uh, the, the rise of big data policing. You know, my last assertion was, because uh, it feels really defeating, by the way, if you, if you read that book, it's kind of like, you know, we're being tracked, the police are tracking us, all this stuff is happening, and there's nothing we can do about it. But then again, like January 6th happened, and all that tracking was like for not, right? Because it's the like, point it just depends on I how have kept people. making again and again. They swore we needed to give up our privacy for all this tracking to prevent incidents like that. And huh, that incident still yeah. happened. Isn't that interesting? At the bunk gym, as we call it. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, what is our buddies? They're not going to do anything crazy. I, I, I mean, that's, and, that's the and, subtext of the point I make. But I'm just like, yeah, I've yeah. been saying you can't trust these people for a reason. <laughs> and so, um, so my thing, uh, some assertions I made off of this was one, um, we always say they, and they are people, right? So I have dear friends that are in law enforcement and that I highly respect, okay? Um, and uh, one of the things that, that I often try and remind people is that um, they, meaning the people that, that are police, are also under this regime, are also being watched 24-7 now are also now like having uh, a, a systematic oppression used within that administration level to, to employee level. Uh, um, uh, is it dichotomy? I can't remember the right word to use. Hierarchy. And, um, and so the fear is not just at the like citizen level. It's like at all these different levels. I mean, that's why we're, we're, we're seeing what we're seeing. And, um, yeah, uh, uh, this is the dread of me. Yeah, um, and so you know, there's the, to me when when I look at uh, a lot of the issues that we're seeing, I don't I don't necessarily see it as like if we just replace these people that were in charge, we would all of a sudden have success. I see systematic issues that have happened and occurred over and over again, even with well-intentioned people. I get the same results. And so, you know, there, there is an evolution of this. Now I will say like at the, at a collegiate level, having taught for the past 15 years, um, over the past two years, I have seen a whole new generation of student, a generation of student that understands like mental health, that understands like uh, shootings that understand like things that even at their conservative level of upbringing, um, they have an understanding of that's just really different. 
and what was happening years ago where they could uh, just not even know or be um, aware of these topics is treated very differently. You know, diversity, equity, inclusion has been a really big push in academia. That's why the right, you know, says that we're all loonies and crackpot professors. But in reality, like they can say that, but we have all these students that are coming in and taking these courses and learning about uh, like different ways to, to look at life and are being influenced in, in, in different ways. And so, I, you know, that was another like level of hope that maybe you all don't see daily because like, you're not teaching like the next generation. But I will report back that uh, that has also been something that's really been inspiring to me is just the students that I teach and, um, and getting to see them really engage and uh, kind of learn uh, new ways of seeing things. Uh, while also retaining their culture and their and their heritage um, from all spectrums, I mean, whether you're, uh, you know, white, Latino, black, Asian, whatever, um, it's really cool to kind of see that and and to see them explore those spaces. Because I think one of the things to me that's rewarding about life and about journey is that you know, getting to create your own narrative and getting to explore yourself and where you come from and and where you see yourself going. And, um, you know, that's why I do what I do. So are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, we're probably, you know, unlike when we have the physical meetups, we don't have a hard end time, but we are starting to, you know, kind of get, probably want to wrap it up here soon. But if anybody has some final questions for Joey, uh, happy to give you a moment to ask them. All right, well, I guess, you know, I'll just say, well, thank you so much for Joey coming. It really was a very unique, wide-ranging, engaging talk. Um, you know, we'd certainly be happy to have you back anytime. Uh, you have any other interesting thoughts or if any of your uh, colleagues might like to tell us about some of the interesting stuff they're working on, if it's in our space. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming. It's, it's been a fun talk. And I guess, you know, I'll just, I'll just say on a bit of a personal note, I mean, I think you know, that I think you, you get it right that, you know, we've got these, uh, I think getting in touch with the meat, as you put it, may be one of the things we really need to explore because I've literally seen people who are very smart. They've got a well-reasoned, well-constructed reality, and yet they're each just sharing links that prove their case to each other and nobody comes away convinced they're any less wrong, you know, and it just, yeah, I don't know. We've, it's an interesting time. We've, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Though, frankly, I'm, uh, I'm fine with, as you put it, the, uh, the last stand of the white man. I always tell people, you know, they're like, you know, they look at me and I'm like, but no, I'm Irish. We were the original victims of English colonialism. So I ain't falling for this trap, basically. <laughs> But I just want to thank yeah. you so much for coming, Joey. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's just interesting because it's like I'm, all, I'm all like super self-conscious saying it. But it's more that like it's it's an observation on my part, and I could be wrong. Someone can. I I mean I noticed the same thing. What have you? And I'm just shaking but my head, going just, here. It'll was, be fine. The future will be fine. Trust me. Calm down. I also, I also follow comedy heavily. Like I'm really into comedians and things like that. And I just noticed that like all the people that are doing edgy comedy right now, that are main like mainstream or like sub mainstream. Um, are white males, you know, like Mark Norman, uh, if you've ever heard of him, or like other comedians, like, and, and I like a lot of their work. It's not that, it's that they have the privilege, you know, uh, uh, another one is, uh, uh, what's his name, D Dylan, Tim Dylan, I think, um, is another guy that's like, they just, they get to say what they want, but because they're taking it back, you know, and I'm just kind of like, what are you really taking back and who did you lose it to? You know, those are some things that like understanding our own agency, right? Like when I show up to a Chicana, meaning a all women's conference on being Chicana, like there's a difference between me opening my big mouth and saying what I have to think and someone else. Like, I, yeah, I, I, can, Context, I can understand What a that. concept. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, one, final, anyways, one final question actually here for you, Joey. Somebody asked him. Um, as a teacher, do you have any opinion on the company Code Monkey for Kids or Code Ninja? So, um, you know, it was, it was, so here, like, coding is a really interesting thing. 
I um <clears throat> I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. Like I I uh you know, I learned to code in high school and I was horrible at it. Um but it did like kind of tickle my the back of my ears uh, a little bit and uh luckily, you know, I was surrounded by people that knew how to code. Um but to me coding I like uh, Scratch. I like any kind of open source software. In terms of, um, in terms of like a company that teaches coding or has coding modules, I'd have to just look and see if they're open source and, and open and open curriculum. Like that's what I support. Uh, for those that don't know what open curriculum is, it's where the um, software and the um, the uh, curriculum itself are all open source and are Creative Commons licensed. Now, that said, just like I use Strava, there's going to be some great closed sourced ones that help people learn in an intuitive way and that is like an Apple-like experience, as I would call it, uh, which I've heard uh, uh, Code Monkey is. Uh, same here, but little one has enjoyed the building of robots, but I hate to force coding on her. I hate coding. Yeah, and so, you know, I, I, I um, so for me, it's like, I let my kid do what they want once I kind of impress it upon them and then go from there. So like my kid um, wanted a skateboard, so I got him a skateboard. And then it's like, I'm like here at practice. And he was like, no, I don't want to do it. And I was like, okay. And then like he wanted to do some more later and now we're at a skate park and he's like standing up and skateboarding at four years old. And I'm like, okay. But it's not like I'm fanatical about it, but I'm kind of just like, if you want to keep doing it. And so what I'm really trying to measure with kids, by the way, my mom was a two year old teacher for 20 years. And so I'm really into early childhood development. Um, what I'm trying to figure out with kids personally is just kind of that, that, that liminal space that like right between the, the, the black and white, that gray space where you are facilitating them and not dictating what they need to do, but creating enough boundaries for them to feel empowered. And that's really hard. I think Kevin probably knows that a little bit too. And everybody else that, you know, uh, works with kids is that like, you know, sometimes you overstep it and sometimes you don't. And so a lot of these programs can be very beneficial to a kid, but sometimes they can also be angst and anxiety and really something they don't want to be doing. And, um, and it's kind of finding that ebb and flow because each kid is different. And so, um, that's my take on it and I'm sticking to it. I, I, uh, so I, maybe my kid will. I think it's a good take. And, you know, I guess I'll just add on, you know, that there's this big push that, you know, all kids got to learn coding or they're going to be screwed in the economy of the future. I don't really endorse that take. What I think, I think you certainly, you're, you teach a kid coding, especially if they like or have an aptitude for it. Yeah. They're probably going to be well positioned for the future because so many things do involve it now. But I think, that's just a subset of a more general, far more important skill, which I think is the real key. And I think our speaker tonight evinces this skill very well, which is just be open to continuously learning new things throughout your life. If you think you can learn a set of skills and coast on that your whole life, you probably won't do very well. But if you instill in a child constant wanting to engage and learn new things, it's less important what they are, just not always having something new you're trying to figure out, not just accepting the world as it's handed to you. I, th I think that's the far more essential skill of which coding is just one manifestation of that drive. So yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say if your kid wants to do that to be like, no, I'm like, just let them do it. Let them go to feel our heart's content. Um, and yeah, like, uh, I, I always tell people, I just want my kid to be a nice person and, and help other people. Cause like, uh, I have a PhD, my wife has a PhD in cultural studies and education. And so I'm really not worried about his education as much as him being just a good person. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to impart because I don't think he's going to have a problem in school. Um, in the sense that like, I mean, I had a problem and I got through it. So I know no matter what, he'll, he'll get through school, but being a good person is, is actually something that's really hard to teach. So, all right. Well, thank I don't you so much, Joey. It's, it's been a pleasure having you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll look forward to hopefully seeing you again next month. Uh, always feel free to 
drop us a line if there's anything you want us to look into or work on with you. But otherwise, uh, hopefully we'll see everybody in a month's time or so. And uh, thank you all for keeping these meetups going during these strange, unprecedented times. So uh, we'll see you all then. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye.